Hello, everyone. Welcome, and thank you for joining us today to discuss the challenges of licensure by endorsement for internationally educated PTs in the US. This event is hosted by the APTA Staff Workgroup for Internationally Educated Physical Therapists, which for the rest of this event, I'll refer by its acronym, IEPTs. This work group came together in August of 2020 and has IEPT representatives who have been working and residing in the US for years. We have PTs from the Philippines, Maria and Ben Aguila, from Latin America, Claudia Herrera and John Castro, and from India, Ankit Shahi and myself. We were brought together by APTA's senior practice specialist, Heidi Kosakowski. An APTA hub community has been created to provide an online forum where we IEPTs can share news and important information to make people aware of the unique challenges we face and to come together and support each other in tackling these issues. What we hope to achieve as an end goal of this work as it relates to today's topic of discussion is to advocate for a streamlined process for licensing IEPTs across all states, and that experienced and US licensed IEPTs no longer be held to different standards from our US trained peers based on minimum years of practice. We encourage you to participate alongside us and join us in ameliorating barriers we encounter. As an APTA member, you can join this hub community by going to communities at APTA.org. Also, please put in your questions and comments in the comments section so we can um, keep engaging with you and answer your questions as you may have them. Today, we are delighted to have you and our esteemed panelists, Dr. Nancy Kirsch, Dr. Ankit Shahi, and Dr. Claudia Herrero with us today to talk about the challenges of licensure by, of, by endorsement by internationally educated PTs. My name is Kripa Dolakia. I live in Philadelphia and work in Chester, PA as an assistant professor at Widener University. I practice in Philadelphia and its surrounding counties as an early interventionist. I received my entry level PT education in Mumbai, India, following which I went on to complete an MS and a DHSC, both from Drexel University. I'm also an ABPTS certified pediatric clinical specialist. I originally obtained my license to practice in 2000 and have been living and working here for over 20 years. Now I request our panelists to introduce themselves. Let's start with Dr. Nancy Kirsch. Thank you very much. It was really a privilege to be invited to share in this tonight. Uh, I'm currently serving as the president of the board of directors of the Federation of State Boards of Physical Therapy. My day job is at uh, Rutgers University where I am the uh, uh, vice chair for rehab uh, services, which includes our two PT programs, our OT program and our speech therapy program. So it really is, uh, as I said, a privilege to be here because this has been an ongoing problem um, that we've dealt with uh, in terms of the, the disparities in licensure across the country and something that we really want to look forward to working together to try to solve and ameliorate some of them. Uh, my opportunities to be involved in APTA, I started off as uh, president of the uh, New Jersey chapter of APTA and have uh, been appointed to the Judicial Committee and also to the um, Reference Committee. So I've had some uh, wonderful opportunities to engage with uh, my colleagues in APTA. So I'm, again, very happy to be here and be part of this. Thank you, Dr. Kirsch. Dr. Shahi. Uh, hey, Kripa. Uh, thank you for inviting me for this platform. And uh, hi everyone, myself, Ankit Shahi. I did my bachelor's in physiotherapy from India, came to US in 2012 to do my master's on student visa. So after that, I ended up completing my clinical doctorate too, which was a great learning experience. And I'm currently working at Christiana Hospital in Delaware as a physical therapist and also an education specialist uh, for the hospital staff and new recruits. And uh, I have been through this. So 
thank you for raising this point because all the internationals and since i've been teaching for npt so so many of my students had to go through this licensure by endorsement and they had so many issues so we'll talk about that definitely later on but uh thank you for inviting me kripa well thank it's great to have you ankit um and um dr claudia herrera how are you good evening thank you for inviting me also for this group it's been very uh interesting to listen to all our commun uh you know uh, problems that we had together in this background so my bachelor's is from mexico city in the hospital abc american british codre um and then i came in 1996 to quinnipiac university to pursue a master's in orthopedics uh, so after that you know i've been working these 25 years in connecticut for different outpatient practices um, we tried to move to Florida, but that didn't work. I'll talk about that later. And then uh, last year, I just finished my doctorate through Texas Tech University, which also took longer than what I anticipated because of my international status, right? Even when I've been working here 25 years. So I work for Select Medical Group. You know, I've been an educator all this time. I try to stay in uh, contact with my country. I taught here for Select Medical Group, but also in Mexico, I try to stay in touch with different associations and universities and try to go almost every year for different uh, workshop and teaching opportunities. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you all for your introductions. Um, it's a privilege to really um, have you all here and um, we are excited to hear from you. Um, we will start today's discussion by highlighting the issue at hand. Uh, what I'm gonna do is provide a background on what the typical process is for an internationally educated PT to achieve licensure to practice in the US and then frame the discussion regarding licensure by endorsement or license transfer. Uh, the FSB PT defines endorsement candidates as individuals who are already licensed to practice in a US jurisdiction and who are requesting licensure in another US juris jurisdiction. So following this brief presentation, uh, we will then talk with the panelists and they can uh, share their expertise on this topic and we can hear more about their experiences. So, thank you. So just to start off in the beginning, um, in the US, an internationally educated PT is also referred to as a foreign trained PT, who is basically a PT whose entry level physical therapy degree has occurred outside of the United States. According to the data from 2014, we comprise about 12% of the US workforce. And we actually span the globe. Um, a 2016 study that was done by Cornwall et al. showed that a vast majority of us come from the Philippines, closely followed by India, Europe, the Middle East, Asia, Canada, Africa, South America, and the Pacific Islands. So when we immigrate and want to practice physical therapy in the US, we have to obtain a license. Um, just as any US educated PT would need to do by taking the NPTE. And so this process is called licensure by examination. So first we're gonna take a look at this process. We as IEPTs need to be eligible to take the NPTE in the first place. All states require First, a credentialed evaluation of our entry level education. So this essentially means that our transcripts get reviewed by an authorized entity and um, they make the determination whether or not our education and training is equivalent to that of what happens in the US. And then based on this evaluation, there are instances where an IEPT may have to take additional courses prior to being permitted to take the NPTE. The second is the establishment of our proficiency in English. So 84.3 of the US jurisdictions require the verification of English uh, language proficiency for internationally educated PTs to be eligible to sit for the NPTE. And this is usually done by taking the TOEFL or the ILTS. So once we've obtained licensure to practice, 
um, and pass the NPTE, this essentially implies that we've undergone credentialing of our entry level education and possibly also have taken additional courses to meet US equivalency. We've established English language proficiency explicitly in those states that require formal assessment of language skills, such as TOEFL or ILTS, and implicitly in states by passing the licensing exam. We also have passed the licensing exam and also any specific jurisprudence exams that may be um, relevant in those respective states. So now let's fast forward to a scenario where an IEPT who is licensed and has been practicing in the US wishes to or needs to move to another state and therefore needs their license transferred. We need to fulfill the requirements for what is called licensure by endorsement. For a practicing US trained PT, the license transfer process is pretty straightforward. However, for IEPTs who are already licensed and have been practicing in the US, and perhaps also having obtained higher educational degrees, perhaps also an ABPTS specialist certification, the rules that apply to us are far different than those that apply to US trained PTs. First, in the event that an IEPT wishes to or needs to transfer their license to another state, we are asked to reestablish our basic competence based on our entry level degree. So here we're looking at a web page from FSBPT's website, which shows the, how many states require this. And you can see that 45 states do. So this step has already been completed back when we needed to establish our eligibility to sit for the NPTE. We have already, based on that initial evaluation of our entry level degree, fulfilled requirements by taking additional courses that were deemed necessary. So in order to complete this step, we have to go through the process of credentialing our entry level education again and take any courses that this particular states where we want our license transferred to deems necessary. Some examples of the courses that my colleagues have had to take are English statistics, courses in natural sciences, arts, algebra, literature and other humanities courses. I'd like to point out here that none of these seem particularly helpful in elevating one's existing PT practice. And they also take time and energy to complete, not to mention the cost that is associated with completing them. Here we're looking at a web page from FSBPT's website, which shows how many states require proof of English language proficiency for a licensed transfer for internationally educated PTs. Yes, we also have to once again determine or prove our English language prof proficiency. Again, we've already established this in order to even sit for the NPTE by passing either a formal language assessment or in the absence of that implicitly demonstrating proficiency by passing the NPTE and by the virtue of the fact that we are active and licensed practitioners in the US. In addition, we may also have obtained post-professional degrees and clinical specializations. Moreover, just as all US educated PTs do, we also maintain our clinical competence by meeting ongoing licensure requirements and through continuing education. Therefore, you could probably appreciate how burdensome the aspects, of, the aspects of transferring our licenses are. The current process of transferring our license to another state requires uh, dealing with different TOEFL scores, which are considered acceptable in different states. Different states also use different coursework tools, which are basically evaluation standards for our, the evaluation of our entry level degrees. It's a very expensive and time consuming process and it certainly impacts our mobility, equal access to jobs and educational opportunities. To focus solely on entry level degree that was obtained in some instances years ago and sometimes more than a decade ago seems impractical and disregards our clinical development and current expertise that we have fostered throughout our careers to deliver excellence in patient care, education and research. Repeated requirements to establish English language proficiency 
also propagates the negative stereotype that non-American individuals do not speak English proficiently. The overall focus, therefore, undermines diversity within the PT workforce rather than celebrating and encouraging contributions from PTs from different educational and cultural backgrounds. President Dunn's recent statement calling to ensure that within our profession and association, no one feels like an outsider anywhere within our bounds, resonates with those of us who have experienced redundant standards for reestablishing competence in the PT profession. We hope to work together to establish, therefore, the same initial credentialing and ELP standards across all states to streamline the process the same standards for experienced and US licensed IEPTs as our US trained peers, perhaps based on minimum years of experience. We have the same shared goal of providing safe and competent services to all our patients and clients, and also increasing diversity within the PT workforce. As providers, we also strive for equal treatment and fair rules that do not discriminate against us based on the place of our entry level education. We have developed and grown as clinicians, educators and scholars in the field and ask that our expertise, skills, contributions and potential be appropriately acknowledged and respected. I first wanna share um, my experience of how I got involved in this work. This happened after I met um, Shruti Joshi and heard her story. Shruti is an internationally educated PT uh, who I met at a professional conference uh, last fall, in the fall of 2019. She has her ABPTS clinical specialization in pediatrics, her DPT, and over 10 years of clinical experience. Shruti has been waiting to move to California where her family lives and started the process of license transfer in 2018. Remember, she was already practicing in Illinois for 10 years before applying for this transfer. The credentialing of her entry level education determined that she had to take college level physics and chemistry classes, as well as ethics and professionalism courses. She did call the State Board of California and was told that no one could have these requirements waived. It took her about four months to find the appropriate universities and classes for these courses and about seven months to complete the coursework. The total process of getting her credentials reviewed and re-reviewed and completing the courses cost her about $6,000. This is in addition to the various other fees that she had to pay to apply for the license transfer. The process has still not been completed and her reevaluation to certify that she has satisfied all the deficiencies is pending with the credentialing evaluation agency. And now there are delays because of COVID. There were times when she has felt like she had to forego or she wanted to forego the process because it was too burdensome. And also she had to, she couldn't pursue interviews or they stalled when employers realized that it could take her months or years to start a job because the endorsement process was not complete. So now I turn to the panelists to hear their experiences and stories. Dr. Shahi, based on your experience and that of your colleagues, would you share what the process of license transfer has been like? What are some of the barriers and hardships that IEPTs face? Can you hear me? Okay, sorry. So thank you, Kriba, for raising this question. Um, it is a very long process, and not only long, it is a very expensive process, too. So first thing we have to do is we have to get our education evaluated by these evaluating agencies. And they take the most popular one is FCCPT, which is a subsidiary of FSBPT. They take at least six months to get your education evaluation complete. And then after six months, they'll tell you, okay, you meet, because most of the international students, they meet the professional requirements, but they lack the general requirements. And as you mentioned in your slides, uh, most of the internationals lack chemistry, physics, uh, natural science, English composition. 
So after six months, now you have to go back and study physics or chemistry. In some of these states, like for example, Pennsylvania, they don't accept online courses. They only accept some of the online courses, but for some of the courses you have to go in the college, which is like, you have to leave your job to attend school now. And on top of that, it's very expensive too. So I'll give you an example of one of my student. Uh, there are so many examples, but this example I find quite funny. So what happened was she she took the license exam for uh, New York. She passed license exam in the very first attempt, a very smart student. But then she wanted to transfer it to some, another state. So that state asked her to uh, go and take physics, chemistry. And funny thing is, uh, trust me, it's not easy to go back and study those laws of Newton or gravitational forces. She ended up failing that course. So a student, uh, she passed a license exam in first attempt, NPT in first attempt. She ended up failing her uh, physics course. So eventually she could not transfer to that state. She's still trying. She's still trying to uh, fulfill the requirement with some other uh, subjects, but it is a very long process. And on top of that, it costs you so much money, like you end up paying thousands and thousands of dollars. So after you fin finish all these credit requirements, you have to again apply for re-evaluation. This time they'll tell you, okay, you meet the requirement, but if you calculate the cost, it can go to approximately $10,000. And most interesting part is not all the states have sta same standard requirement. So if I'm applying to state of Pennsylvania, they have different set of courses I have to finish, most of the general credits. But if I decide to go to some other state like Connecticut, they have different set of requirements. And I always think that by studying these courses like chemistry or natural sciences, it's not gonna help me as a therapist, it doesn't help the board because they are not getting the money for those courses. It's not gonna help the patients. So I think somebody needs to tell them that uh, we need to change these requirements because it's not helping anyone in society. It's only helping the schools and the evalu evaluating agencies to make money. But otherwise it's not helping anyone. And I am glad that you raised this kind of point that endorsement is a big problem, definitely, we should reach out to boards and explain them. If you want us to do something, make us attend some uh, or do some courses on vestibular rehab or something that will help us professionally and the patients, not uh, go and study those natural sciences and chemistry courses. So it is it is very long and it's it's not worth it. Thank you. Um, my next question is for uh, Dr. Herrera. Dr. Herrera, um, you decided to not pursue a license transfer. Um, can you tell us why and how that may have affected your career trajectory? Yeah, so I'll tell you, you know, similar to the previous stories, when I came in 1996 to Quinnipiac, of course I wanted to work after what I was learning here. And I was, if not the only one, the people that are working, practicing what we're learning in theory, right? And in the at school. So uh, I went through the credentialing uh, process, which is cost and it takes like six months. There were two companies here in Connecticut at the time. I don't know if that has changed. So that's money. You have to pay to an official translator, you know, to do transcript, you know, requirement. And then again, I like Dr. Uh, doctor, you know, uh, they tell us that we don't have enough general education credits. I think that's the bottom line here that uh, talking these 25 years with a lot of colleagues, doctors, nurses, radiologists, everything, and PTs, uh, in South America and Europe, you, the, the previous education before college, we already have that baggage of knowledge. In elementary school, kids have a lot of social sciences, uh, basic sciences that we learn, right? But here in the US, you know, college gives you, uh, you know, the liberal arts palette where you can like also try different, you know, there's, there's good things about it, right? You know, kids, I guess, at, at the, around that age, you know, they're not sure what they want to study. So it gives them an idea of different um, fields. 
But when you come here and you're already a physical therapist, in most countries, you know, we just take courses pertaining to physical therapy, you know, like medical anatomy, you know, physiology, gynecology, phlegy, all those, right? Uh, in my case and in Mexico, they are taught by doctors and by nurses and by PTs, right? So when you come here and they tell you again and again, you're missing general credits or like, I taught them earlier than you guys, and I have a very good background, right? And then again, like uh, Dr. Ankit said, how is that going to make me a better physical therapist for my patients? So anyways, you know, in most cases, those credits and, and you know, the study for the national exam, we pass a test at the first or second time. And then, and, and like Dr. Shaki, because if you already got a job, hire you, but they'll pay you half, you know, like a PTA or like a technician, you pass the test. Now, um, eight years later, we wanted to move to Florida, or my ex-husband had an option also to California. So the transfer to California actually worked, was very smooth. But when I tried to pursue to Florida, they asked to do another credentialing evaluation. And when I told them I already got one and my background hasn't changed, Actually, it's gotten better because I have a master's degree now from the U.S. They said, no, 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 no. We have to do it again. So I did it. And then they told me the same thing again. Oh, you're lacking general credit uh, courses. So me thinking, okay, I'm already going to spend more money and time. I had the same thinking. I said, can I take classes in, you know, physical therapy, you know, in neurology and pediatrics or something else? And they told me because I went through a um, uh, jury in, physical, uh, in Florida to a hearing from the Board of Physical Therapy, they told me, stop thinking about PT courses. You just need to go back and take like geography, history. And I'm like, so long story short, we end up not pursuing that. We thought it was not the only place on earth. And you know, um, we stay in Connecticut, but uh, 10 years ago, I wanted to pursue a doctorate and I put all my papers and requirements through Texas Tech. Uh, first, they told me, yeah, if you have a master's degree from here, it's going to take you 35 credits. And I made the math and I said, oh, it's going to be like four years. I can do this. You know, I'm a mom of two, but I have time to do this. And then on the first semester, they said, oh, we didn't see that your undergrad is from Mexico. So we're going to consider you a bachelor and you have to do 70 credits. So, I mean, I persisted. And I guess a lot of the uh, foreign educated PTs are people uh, that bring this persistence and they want to succeed, but I don't think that was right. And they told me, well, we do this to everybody, people from South America, from Asia, from Europe. Um, you know, if they had an undergrad, undergraduate education from there, we're going to consider them undergrad, even if they have a master's or something else. So that didn't stop me, but it was a big burden than, you know, of time and money. Well, Claudia, congratulations and good for you for, you know, sticking through it because I can only imagine how challenging that must have been. Um, and thank you for sharing that with us. Dr. Kirsch, um, my next question is for you. Uh, can you shed light on the process of licensure by endorsement and why the requirements are what they are? And um, speak also about why Perhaps there has not there's not a movement to streamline the rules so that there can be some reciprocity between states in terms of like the TOEFL scores and the coursework tools that are used. Well, that is quite the mouthful there, Kripa. <laughs> okay. Uh, we can I, divide that into two, perhaps. I'm going to divide that into uh, quite a few things, actually. If I could explain that, I could explain how the United States functions which I think right now would probably be of great benefit to everybody, but I actually can't do that. I can tell you that uh, a couple of things in what I've just heard are very distressing. Uh, the primary one is that I keep hearing about a lack of respect. And um, that is the last thing I think any of us as PTs wanna hear about our colleagues, that any of us would feel disrespected. Um, and this is something in terms of my 30 years in regulation uh, that I've really tried to, to work on. Uh, the fact that it, it's very disconcerting when somebody comes for a license and they have all this experience and all of these credentials 
And I know them. I know them. I know how good they are as a PT. I've met them at APTA conferences. I work with them and they can't get licensed in certain jurisdictions. And it's extremely disconcerting. So I want to start with just a little bit of my story um, and to tell you that endorsement is tough. Um, it's, it's tough because we have 53 jurisdictions, uh, the 50 states, uh, District of Columbia and Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico. And we have 53 different ways in which we do that, uh, do endorsement. Um, and we pretty much have different ways in which we do initial licensure as well, but endorsement is really uh, critically uh, different between jurisdictions. Uh, I was explaining before we got on that I was initially licensed in Pennsylvania, took my exam in Pennsylvania. At that time, there wasn't a central way in which the exam was done. And there wasn't a, a given central score that was a passing score. Um, my uh, exam scores were stored in the basement of the Capitol building in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and the building caught on fire. So my exam scores no longer exist. I can endorse into certain states, but not into all states. And I was educated in the United States. So endorsement is tough. Um, it, it shouldn't be that way. And, uh, you know, I can talk a long time about what's being done, but let me just give you a couple of things. First of all, I just wanted to set the record straight that FCCPT is a credentialing agency. It is independent of FSBPT. It's not a part of FSBPT. It's separate, it is uh, a separate entity and functions um, separately. They're physically located in the same building that FCCPT rents space, just as many of the uh, sub, uh, subgroups of APTA does uh, from APTA. So we're talking about states' rights here, right? We're talking about every state has the right to do what they want to do and how they want to do it. It's difficult. Um, we have been trying for years from FSBPT and within the states to try to unify some of the expectations so that you don't have to go between states and show your credential evaluation again. Um, that there would be one accepted way in which the coursework tool would be utilized. There would be one accepted score for um, you know, taking a look at what the requirements are for English language uh, requirements. Um, so some of these things, you can't get the states to necessarily do that um, in, in terms of law, but we can get some agreement from the states in terms of some of the other things. So there's a, and I don't have time to explain it now, but there's an alternate approval process that uh, FSBPT has introduced. And states that participate in that are using the same credentials so that if that's accepted in those states and that spreads across the United States, then it's going to make it much easier to endorse because everybody's using the same standards. The licensure compact, although it's, it, you know, it's, it is a way in which to access uh, services across the country and for people to be able to be more flexible in their licensure, some of the requirements in order to be part of the compact will require certain standardization about what is utilized. So it's another way in which we can introduce standardization into what's required. And therefore, it would make endorsement much easier between jurisdictions as well as initial licensure. So I'm going to stop there because, again, I can go on for hours and I know we don't have hours. <laughs> Thank you. Um that was um, very insightful, and thank you for sharing your personal experience. And sorry about that. That um, just sheds light on, you know, more so like how difficult this is, um, in fact, for everybody. Um, so I wanted to um, loop back to Anka Chahi, and um, so our uh, co-staff um, work group members, uh, Ben and Maria, have um, been in touch with their Filipino PT colleagues. Um, through their regular trips to the Philippines and um, their initiatives through their future foundation. Um, how do you or do you stay in touch with the PT profession in India? And do you have any advice for other Indians who might wish to practice in the US? Thank you for this question, Kripa. So yes, we are very closely connected with therapists back home. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, one of my professor from where I did my bachelor's in physiotherapy, he reached out to us, uh, study buddy that, can you guys teach 
or conduct some classes every semester to teach some some cutting edge uh, techniques or intervention techniques that you guys are learning. So for example, I go to these certification courses as part of my CEU, such as vestibular rehab or lymphedema therapy or management. So any certification that I take, I conduct one or two classes for therapists back home. Uh, and it's a, it's a virtual class, it's free class, we don't go there. And it's a learning experience for them. I think we are privileged that we got a chance to come to US and learn the most advanced techniques. So we should take this opportunity to, to, to teach therapists back home because they have limited resources. And if we can improve or under, improve their understanding even, even by 25%, it does eventually help a patient. So uh, we are involved in teaching some of the courses uh, in some of the universities back home. Most of the universities are, are uh, from my local town. And uh, another thing I'm involved in, or our group NPT study buddy is involved in, we teach students for the license examination for NPT, US license exam, or Canadian license exam, PCE. We also teach for the Canadian practical examination. So we are very actively uh, connected with all our therapists and students back home. And uh, it's I think it's our privilege uh, that we got this opportunity. So we should definitely share it with them. Thank you. Thank you, um, Dr. Herrera, um, can you talk a little bit about how your uh, background as an IEPT has impacted your practice here in connecting with uh, the Spanish speaking population? Um, all right, maybe we'll come back to um, Claudia. In the meantime, I sort of wanted to loop back to you, Dr. Kirsch. Um, you did mention the issue of state rights and how each state gets to have their specific requirements. So just as a group who wants to advocate for change towards this, how do you think, um, Can how do we approach this here then? So I think there's some wonderful work we can do together. Okay. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'm, re I'm really very excited about what we can do together. Um, so FSBPT cannot dictate to the states uh, what they do uh, at all. Again, every state has the right to determine what their requirements are. But um, a, a great example is the licensure compact where FSBPT and APTA said, we need to have a way in which we can make services more accessible and have therapists be able to be more available to patients. And we determined that the licensure compact was the route to go, and we did it together. Um, we did it together from the very beginning of planning of it, and we're still working very hard together to get the licensure compact in every jurisdiction. So APTA can handle all of the legislative parts of it, where um, where the individual jurisdictions can't do that. An individual licensing board cannot introduce legislation, but a state chapter certainly can. So working together, um, the you know the the work group that you're working on uh, with what we're we have a, a similar type of committee for FSBPT. Those two committees working together can really, I think, start to enact some very good legislation that would come through and also being able to um, to look at you know possibilities for how we as a group uh, could start to look at the kind of the easier things to deal with um, and then work up to some of the more difficult things. Um, one of the things just very simply is taking a look at a practice act. Some practice acts have language in them that would allow an individual such as Claudia to um, to be assessed by, you know, based on her credentials separate from the credential evaluation. So it's things like that that we can look at and say, can we introduce legislation that would allow more flexibility? Thank you. 
That is um, that is really um, helpful advice. And I think some uh, some of the times that um, you know you mentioned that there might be some language in there, but I think that it's a knowing that that language might exist and that we can in fact access it because as an applicant you may not know that because you you know don't essentially read the practice act but even i guess creating some transparency um about the um avenues that are possible for us to explore would be another step that i think might be helpful and again, I, I think APTA and FSBPT working together on this would be really a, a, a way in which to really affect change. Yes, yes, thank you. Um, let's see if we can uh, get Claudia back in here um, to, um, hi Claudia. Mm -hmm. um, so the question was um, about how that. your background, hi, yeah, I can hear you. Um, as an IEPT has impacted your practice, um, especially in connecting with the Spanish speaking population? Yeah, like I mentioned before, uh, I think not only Latinos, but a lot of minorities keep coming to this con, a lot of opportunity, and there's many more coming as patients. So, you know, uh, I think big companies and small companies are realizing that there's value on being bicultural or tricultural, having another language, because they need uh, from, as a translator, uh, you know better the culture from a lot of people, you know, how to approach patients. Now, if, even in school, you know, they're teaching you, uh, even to doctors, how to treat patients depending on their culture, right? So I've always been close to the community. Uh, I belong to the board of a nonprofit it's called Spanish Community of Wallingford here. And, you know, I've helped in different ways uh, to promote health, you know, to do some workshops, to promote exercise and all that stuff. And like I mentioned, I try to stay in contact with my country a year uh, for teaching to congresses and stuff like that. But, but I think um, every year, every five years, every decade, you can see the value from having another culture in you, another language to help you know, even the business grow here. Yes, absolutely. Um, thank you for that response. Um, one of our um, viewers have, has asked a question about um, what the definition of international is in this case. Does this include all countries other than the US or international in this case means countries that have PT majors and licensure exams, example, Canada, India, Philippines, Spain, et cetera. So maybe um, Dr. Shahi, do you wanna answer this question? Sure, I can, I can do that. So uh, international means anybody who's not educated in United States and everybody who is educated outside the states, they have to get their education evaluated. Even if you're educated in Canada or United Kingdom, you have to get your education evaluated. And if you lack the credits uh, required by that state, even you have to fulfill the requirement for that state. So it's a standard rule that everyone outside the United States has to follow and uh, same process goes for that. Thank you. Um, so we have about um, close to 15 minutes left, and I wanted to just uh, have all our panelists come back on for a final word. And some of you have, you know, sort of spoken um, to this, but I wanted to um, say that, you know, despite getting our advanced degrees in the U.S., including our clinical specializations, we continue to be considered internationally educated. Um, and that really fails to acknowledge that our knowledge and practice has evolved no differently than a US educated PT. And so what are, can you just speak to like an, a way in which we can create an environment that really respects our experience and advanced degrees um, and holds that in regard? Claudia, do you wanna go first? So, so, any suggestions for this process to be a little bit easier, you mean? Yes. Or how can we create an environment that um, respects our education and, you know, our degrees that we've gotten here? Yeah, like I mentioned, like I mentioned, 
your meetings. I understand that coming to this country, you have to adapt to the rules to know that you have the same education like anybody would do in any other country, right? Sir, enforce stronger here. And, and that's good. First process to know that you speak the language, that you have a similar education and background, right? Especially in, in education. But once you got that, transferring to another state or pursuing a higher degree shouldn't pose you back to the step number one. You know, you already have that background. Plus, you're already here practicing, gain, gaining knowledge of how PT is, uh, you know, used here. And even with the legal matters that we don't have in other countries. And you have extra um, education. First of all, I know a lot of these, they pursue higher degrees, you know, for education. Yes, I a uh, chip of being persistent. The immigrant is not easy. It teaches you about perseverance and resilience. But um, once you got here and been practicing for a few years, I think they should treat you like, a, you know, another North American PT that came out of a school, especially if you already had extra credits and education from here. So that would make it much easier. And from what I see, even uh, students, you know, always tell us that they benefit from having that extra cultural experience. You know, we always come back saying, oh, you know, they're doing these techniques in Argentina or in France or so. It's a it's a win win for everybody, I think. Uh, can I can I respond to that as well? Yes, please. So I really don't see um, my colleagues who are trained, uh, who are educated outside the United States to be in any way uh, less educated and most of the time more highly educated than uh, some of uh, my colleagues here that were educated in the United States. And I find that, um, you know, being involved in the international regulatory community, that particularly in the regulatory world, most countries are, that are have regulation are way ahead of us in the United States, and we are striving to catch up with what they're doing. So I think that what you're doing is exactly what you what is in the best interest of being able to assimilate um, and understand that we have different backgrounds, but both of them really contribute very strongly to what makes better practice here in the U.S. And just continuing on and doing some of the things that you've been doing, uh, that Ben and Maria, uh, you know, are doing here in New Jersey uh, in terms of uh, getting the chapter to really understand that we have a very valuable resource in terms of the people that were educated elsewhere and have brought those skills at a higher level to the United States. So thank you for that. Thank you. Um, thank you for your very encouraging words um, for the work that we uh, want to do towards this. Um, it means a lot, given your expertise and um, experience on this matter. Um, I have a question in the chat, which um, maybe um, Ankit could answer, perhaps. If not, uh, we can uh, um, have any uh, uh, either of you answer, is whether the transitional DPT degree can make a difference in the licensure by endorsement process. Yeah, I can answer that. So. It can help to some extent. It can help you fulfill the requirements, especially the professional requirements. But transitional DPT is not gonna help with the general credits, which is the biggest problem for internationals. So uh, TDPT will help you with uh, screening and delegation or some of the professional courses that we internationals lack based on CWT6 or based on the coursework tool. But uh, that won't help you fulfill requirements like English composition or chemistry or physics. The other part of that that's of concern is that, you know, um, many states have very clear, explicit, uh, you must be a graduate of a CAPTI approved program. And since they're, the TDT, uh, DPTs are not CAPTI approved, uh, it, you know, reduces that ability to use it. Yes. Thank you. Um, I do want to remind our viewers that uh, please, if we don't get to the questions that you are asking us, uh, please make sure that you can email us at practice at APTA.org and we will uh, get back to you. Um, so thank you um, for um, doing that um, in advance. Um, 
we have um, another question, um, which takes me to um, Ankit. I guess you're the best person to answer this is um, Shilpi Gupta wanted to know if she can prepare for the NPTE from India, if she could take the um, study buddy classes from there. Uh, yeah, uh, so uh, we do teach online for this license exam. So you can take our classes. We have students attending our classes from Colombia or Brazil or India or any part of the world. So yeah, you can prepare for this license exam from anywhere, but you do have to come to United States or, or US territory to take the license exam. I'll share one information uh, that uh, in Canada, because of this COVID, uh, the written exam got canceled. So what they did, they allowed the students to take exam from home. And you can take exam uh, from India, you can take exam from uh, anywhere in the world, except few countries. So, and the exams were properly regulated by Prometric and Prometric is a very uh, reliable organization. They properly regulated the exam. So that was a good uh, step taken by a Canadian board that they allowed you to take exam from your home. That also, makes you more safe. It prevents the spread of this infection. And uh, it's uh, much more reliable for future. Like if anything like this happens again in future, because things are again in some of the states are getting worse. So something like that might be helpful in United States too. If they will allow, not like outside United States, but if they can allow people in US to take the exam from home, that might be an effective strategy for future. Thank you. Um, there is a question about whether or not there is a difference between what people refer to as endorsement versus reciprocity. Would one of you like to answer that? So most of the laws require endorsement, meaning that they're endorsing the credentials of the individual rather than reciprocity. Reciprocity is more what happens with the compact where I, t I accept what you have from this jurisdiction mm. and if you're still licensed there, we're going to give you a compact privilege in another jurisdiction. Endorsement is really looking more at the credentials. Thank you. Thank you. So um, this question comes from um, Shruti Joshi um, asking, what can individual therapists do in their own states. And I would like to hear from the panelists if any of you have suggestions, because this is a great segue for um, me to share a couple more slides about um, what we can do together. But I wanna put it out to you guys if you have any suggestions. I would just say, I think you need, I think you need to work within the state chapter uh, APTA is really the best advocate for us um, with the state government. Thank you, Dr. Yeah. So I also emailed uh, State of Delaware that uh, just requested for an appointment and uh, they agreed to that. And uh, they are willing to listen at least if more and more people can start writing emails about these things, I'm sure they will understand that why these kind of courses and maybe nobody raised this issue. That's why it went on for so long. So if we can start raising the issue with the help of APTA, that will be, I think states will understand that and they will make some changes to these. Yes, I, I would have to agree with you there uh, completely. A lot of times when I have engaged in this conversation uh, with US trained PTs, they don't seem to, I mean, rightfully so, right? They've not been through the experience. So they really don't know what it is like. And um, I have had great allies um, in our US trained PTs who've come alongside us. And um, for example, the president of our Pennsylvania chapter has really become a strong ally to help me um, reach the PT state board. And everybody is very warm and wants to help. So I think that coming together and approaching each of your state chapters and your state boards is the way to go, uh, which is a great segue into um, the last two slides that I wanna share um, about um, how you can be involved um, in this work that we want to do collectively with you. Um, 
is that we'd love for you to be a champion in your state. So we would like for you to advocate in your state, partner with your chapter presidents, approach your state board, um, and become APTA members to join our national community of internationally educated PT so we can really come together as a strong force and unite um, to uh, tackle some of these changes. And how we can support your work um, in doing this is really um, we have letter templates that we can provide you that you can use to reach out to your respective state chapter presidents and similarly to the state boards. Um, we can share our experiences and we can talk about what we have learned from our work um, to make some changes and support you in that way. So we really want to um, gather a collective voice to um, share all of the challenges that we face and come together um, to ameliorate them. Um, so please reach out to us. We would love for you to share your ideas through the Hub community. Uh, we want to learn more about the issues that you face so we can tackle them together. Uh, please join the APTA Hub community uh, for internationally educated PTs. Um, this final slide um, has all of our contact information. Um, we can um, be, we're right here to support you. So please reach out. Um, and also, if we didn't get to um, any of your questions today, please, uh, once again, um, just a reminder is um, to email us at practice at apta.org. Um, I think we might actually have time for one more question. Um, is oh, this is a question uh, from Britta Pen Pedersen, who says regarding the NPTE board exams, why isn't there a real patient component? So I'm not sure, uh, Britta, what you mean by real patient, whether you mean uh, why we don't do an OSCE in the United States like we do in Canada, or you mean um, more like video clips, which have now been added to the MPTE and more of them will be added as time goes on. So I'm not quite sure which of those things you're talking about. Uh, an OSCE we don't do primarily because of the cost. Um, and because of the number of centers that are available in order to do an OSCE. Ankit, do you have anything you want to add to that? Yeah, I can. I think uh, she's asking that um, some of the questions that come in NPT, they are more, they are from textbooks. And uh, I have attended some of the meetings with FSBPT. Their idea is they want to have standardized exam. They don't want to uh, pick a research paper and frame a question from a research paper because you'll have one research paper saying something about mobilization and another research paper saying something against mobilization. So there won't be any standard. So in order to maintain a same standard throughout the states or for everybody taking the exam, that's the reason they take questions directly from the book. So it might look like, oh, it's theoretical, but uh, they don't have much option in order to keep it entry level and uh, keep it standard throughout for everyone. The other aspect of that is it needs to make sure that we meet all the standards in terms of uh, not being um, it, not being fair to a variety of people taking the exam in terms of language. That's true. Okay, with two minutes remaining, final question for Dr. Kirsch <laughs> um, is, what do you think FSBPT can do to help with this, if they can, because I know you said they don't, you know, have any power over what the states decide to do regarding this. But is there any, is there any agency that they do have that maybe we can? Um, so there's some really exciting things going on right now that are part again of the alternate approval and again of the compact that are starting to bring some uniformity in terms of requirements. If we have uniformity in terms of requirements for initial licensure, for access to the exam, um, and for all those things, those are things that translate over to endorsement. And so it takes a long time. Nothing is fast when it comes to legislation or, or government. 
but these are all things that um, I see some really good progress down the road. Thank you. Um, so I want to um, bring this um, event to a close by thanking all of you uh, for your time and for sharing your experiences and expertise. Um, I think we all have work ahead of us to do, but we can do it together. And that's the message. Uh, this is not something that we cannot tackle. So we encourage all of you to join the Hub community, to come together and be champions in your state. And please reach out to us with any questions um, and comments about this. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shahi, Dr. Kirsch, and Dr. Herrera for your um, incredible time today. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Bye.